So we're looking at alkenes now, but uh, before we look at them explicitly, um, what I want us to just uh, look at first is um, carbocations. So um, let's have a look at what we mean by a carbocation first then. So we're talking about molecules uh, in which there is a carbon atom with a positive charge on it. So there's just a, a very simple example here. And that central carbon has effectively lost the electron it would have shared with another atom that it was bonded to. Um, so it's electron, it's, it has one more proton than electrons as far as the charge uh, is concerned around the carbon. Um, so we have a positively charged carbon. Now we've uh, looked at this classification um, of primary, secondary and tertiary before. We looked at it um, when we did the lesson on halogenoalkanes or haloalkanes. Um, and we're going to also be classifying alcohols as primary, secondary and tertiary. And in all of three, uh, the primary, secondary and tertiary ref refers to how many carbons or how many alkyl groups are attached to the thing that we're interested in. Um, so in this example, uh, we're interested in the positively charged carbon. Um, so maybe what I should just do before we move on is just clarify to you what we mean here by alkyl groups. So an alkyl group, uh, it can be anything like a methyl, it can be an ethyl, it could be propyl. Basically, it's a carbon chain. Um, and that chain doesn't have to be linear. We could have a branch chain. So we could have something like methyl ethyl. So something like that. Um, but um, we have an alkyl group attached to whatever group that we're interested in. It's the positively charged carbon here. In a halogenoalkane, it is the carbon that's bonded to the halogen. Uh, in an alcohol, it's the carbon that's bonded to the OH group. So when you look along the bottom, you can see the primary uh, carbocation has just one alkyl group attached to the positively charged carbon. Secondary has two alkyl groups attached to the positively charged carbon. And the tertiary has three alkyl groups attached to the positively carbon. And that's going to be very important um, shortly um, when we consider the reaction and the mechanism um, involving alkenes. Now, knowing uh, whether a carbocation is um, primary, secondary or tertiary um, gives us a, a way of a relative measure of their stability. So this stability here is um, in relation to each other. So we are saying that a primary carbocation is less stable than a secondary carbocation, which is less stable than a tertiary carbocation. Why that matters is going to, be, is going to become important when we look at the mechanism um, behind um, the reaction involving alkenes. So the difference in this carbocation stability is down to something called the inductive effect. Um, and it's something that you've already um, come across, although maybe it hasn't been termed that before. So when you did bonding and you did polar bonds, um, you talked about, uh, you considered the difference in electronegativity between adjacent atoms of a, in a covalent bond. And remember, um, electronegativity was um, the ability or power to attract a pair of electrons in a covalent bond. So if something was more, an atom was more electronegative than another atom, then it had a greater ability to attract the pair of electrons. So those electrons were drawn more towards the more electronegative um, element or atom. And this resulted in a polar bond. And we represented a polar bond um, by um, uh, using delta plus and delta minus. So we've got it at the bottom here. So we've got an example here where we've got carbon and chlorine bonded together and the chlorine is a more electronegative element than carbon. So it draws the electron density towards it and we get this um, difference, uh, this difference in partial charge. So we have a delta positive carbon and a delta negative um, chlorine. Um, and that is an example of the inductive effect. Um, now I've basically, my little green arrow here is not a real thing. It's not something that you would show in an exam. It's not something that you would show um, necessarily even in, um, or you would see in a textbook or whatever, but it, for me, it's a way of visualizing the direction that the electron density is being either pushed or withdrawn, depending on the circumstance. Um, so it's being um, withdrawn towards the chlorine in this example at the bottom. So in our example of 
carbon chlorine bond in our uh, carbon halogen bond. Um, this is an example of the negative inductive effect, and um, it was the key. It was a key feature in the reactivity of um, halogenoalkanes uh, because it was because of the delta positive carbon that the nucleophile um, we got a nucleophilic reaction. Um, so remember, a nucleophile was a, an electron pair donor. Um, that the, that electron pair was attracted to the delta positive carbon, and we got the breaking of the carbon halogen bond, and so we got the nucleophilic substitution reaction taking place. Um, if instead of being a um, halogen, for example, we have an alkyl group um, bonded to our carbon, then alkyl groups do, do, instead of withdrawing electron density, they push electron density. So um, in a sense, you can think of alkyl groups as being electron donating, um, um, and you can think of something like a halogen on, uh, bonded to a carbon as being electron withdrawing. So when we've got alkyl groups bonded to a carbon, uh, we can think of it instead of now being a positive inductive effect. So if we look now at a carbocation, hopefully we can begin to understand why a tertiary carbocation might be more positive than a secondary, which in, conversely is more positive than a primary carbocation. So we know a, if it's a carbocation, we know it's a positively charged species, therefore we know it's a very electron poor, and it's got this whole positive charge on the carbon. Um, so anything that is, donates electron density, anything that in effect reduces the size of that positive charge, um, is going to stabilise the iron. So like a, a useful rule of thumb generally in chemistry is the more that you can reduce a charge on something or spread it out, that's another way of thinking about it, because you can't get rid of the whole charge. What's really happening is that whole charge is being smeared out. Um, so it's not just being concentrated on simply and solely on one atom, the more that you can um, spread the charge out, uh, the more stable um, something tends to be. Um, so if we've got three alkyl groups all pushing electron density onto the positively charged carbon, that makes it a more stable species. And the relevance of that to alkenes will become apparent very shortly. So we're now going to consider the reactions of alkenes. Um, when we did alkanes, uh, they underwent um, free radical substitution. Uh, when we did haloalkanes, um, they underwent nucleophilic substitution or elimination. And um, now with alkenes, they undergo electrophilic addition. So we need to start really by understanding a little bit better the functional group um, of an alkene, which is the carbon-carbon double bond. And um, so if we look at what I've drawn here, uh, I've drawn it in a, as a three-dimensional shape. So if we're considering the shape, if we go again back to our bonding topic, and if we focus uh, on the shape around each carbon um, in this ethene molecule, um, we can see that there are essentially three bonding pairs. So even though there's a double bond, um, in terms of VESPA, in terms of valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, um, you treat a double bond as a, as a single bond or as a or as a bonding pair of electrons. So around um, each carbon we've got three bonding pairs and we've got no lone pairs. And if you remember your shapes, what you get is a trigonal planar shape. So all of these bond angles are going to be 120 degrees and the molecule is planar, so it is flat. So if we were to draw the molecule from above, um, we would be actually able to draw it like our normal displayed formulae. So this would be looking at the ethene molecule from above. Um, and there's our circle, you see, and that's why we've got 120 degrees is split into three, 120 degrees, 120 degrees. Okay. So now we need to um, focus on the carbon-carbon double bond and consider its key features. Now there is, um, it would ideally, ideally we it would be useful for us to understand something called hybridization. Um, that isn't in the A uh, A level syllabus. Um, to really go on and explain it would take. Um, too long as far as this video is concerned, but what I will do is I will add a link 
um, into our classroom, which explains hybridization. You don't need to know it to be able to do what uh, you need to do with alkenes, but I think it does help your understanding. Okay, so I've drawn the the single bonds, and we know that a, a single covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. So between each carbon and hydrogen, we have one electron from carbon and one electron from hydrogen, and we've got our shared pair of electrons. And then we know that the carbon carbon bond is a double bond, but in essence that means initially a single bond, um, and that is also going to be one electron from each carbon. So if we just focus on the sort of single bonds, as it were, in the, an ethene molecule, and we focus on the electrons, uh, we can see that we've used up three electrons for each carbon. And we know that in the higher energy level, um, there are four electrons um, in the second energy level there are four electrons. The remaining electron in each um, with each carbon uh, is now found in uh, the p orbital. So if I just draw a p orbital and this p orbital is perpendicular or at right angles or at 90 degrees to um, the plane um, of the carbon hydrogen carbon carbon single bonds. Um, so we should draw that spare electron. Okay. Um, or do that one again. Let's do it upside down like that. Anyway, um, so what then happens is that these two p orbitals overlap. Okay, so what happens is that those two single electrons now become a pair in effect, or are now, but sorry, occupy this space. This is now the second pair of electrons, um, and they are um, delocalized, which means they can move between these two carbon atoms. So we get this delocalized area uh, above and below the plane, the carbon uh, above and below the plane that the ethene molecule is in. So we call this single bond a sigma bond. Okay, that's the Greek letter. Sigma bond, that's sigma. And then we call this delocalized second bond, as it were, the thing that makes it a double bond, we call that a pi bond. So pi as in 3.14, although that's not what it means here. Um, so it's just the Greek letter pi. Um, so that's essentially how the bonding works in the carbon-carbon double bond. So what that means is we now have a region of very high electron density between the two carbon atoms. Um, not only is it high electron density, but because the molecule is planar, um, we can say that that pi bond is relatively exposed. So um, uh, you can, if you like, access the molecule very easily from above um, or from below. All right, so it's very accessible. Um, that's why it is relatively exposed. Um, and then if we have got this region of high electron density, then we're going to have uh, an area that's very attractive to anything that is positively charged. So it's this high electron density that is the key feature, really, of an alkene. Um, that's going to attack anything which is slightly positive. Um, that species that's attacked, we're going to be uh, call, is going to be called an, ele an electrophile. And our AQA definition of an electrophile is an electron per acceptor. So remember, a nucleophile is an electron per donor, and an electrophile is an electron per acceptor. So if actually, if you think about it. You can't have a reaction. Um, when we've been talking about nucleophilic substitution, there must have been an electrophile as well, uh, because um, there was something, the nucleophile was donating an electron pair, but there was the halogen or alkane accepting the electron pair. So you, you will always have an electrophile and a nucleophile. Um, the, how we decide which term we're using in to describe the reaction is, what is the role of the species that the um, organic molecule we're interested in, the halogenoalkane, the alkene, what is the role of the species that that organic molecule is reacting with? So in the halogenoalkane, it was reacting with something like ammonia. The ammonia was a nucleophile, hence nucleophilic substitution. Um, in the case here with an alkene, what the alkene is going to react with is an electrophile, so hence electrophilic addition. So we're going to consider 
the first uh, the mechanism for this addition reaction. Um, it may have been something that you very briefly did at GCSE, not the mechanism I mean, but just the idea of the reaction. Um, so alkenes undergo addition reactions. Um, an addition reaction means you don't get any other product. Um, so you can see you've got two, two species on the left here and only one species on the right, um, and it's an addition reaction. So here's um, the mechanism in its most simplified form. Um, I say simplified because we're going to have to appreciate a little bit more the, um, the added complexity of carbocation intermediates when relevant um, later. But uh, so that's why I'm starting with ethene. It's the simplest alkene. Um, and here um, we've got the hydrogen bromide. And because hydrogen and bromine have different electronegativities, we've got a polar molecule. Uh, the hydrogen is delta positive, the bromine is delta minus. So uh, when, the, when the hydrogen bromide comes in at the correct orientation, remember collision theory, um, then this reaction can take place. So um, we have that region of uh, strong electron density or high electron density, sorry, between the two carbons in the carbon carbon double bond uh, and the pair of electrons in the pi bond, they um, attack uh, or move to uh, the hydrogen of the hydrogen halide here. So we represent that movement. Remember an arrow with a double head is the movement of a pair of electrons. So the pair of electrons in the pi bond are moving and forming a new covalent bond with the hydrogen. And then the pair of electrons in the hydrogen bromine bond move on to the bromine to make a bromide ion. And so we get a um, carbocation intermediate. The bromide ion um, now attacks the um, positively charged carbon. Um, so we are showing the movement of a pair of electrons. So firstly, we should show that pair of electrons. It's a lone pair, which is why we must um, we must draw the arrow from the lone pair, and then that arrow goes towards um, to the carbon. Sorry, the positively charged carbon, and we get our haloalkane in this particular reaction as our product. Um, there's this um, thing called Markinoff's rule. Um, it may or may not be in. Um, your textbooks or study guides. It's not really an explanation. It's just a sort of a useful rule to follow that um, if, you're, uh, if you're reacting a compound, it says HX here, so it's uh, any hydrogen halide, and we are adding it to an asymmetrical alkene. May as well be consistent with uh, what I did with um, haloalkanes, and did talk about them being asymmetrical rather than unsymmetrical. Um, anyway, the hydrogen in the HX becomes attached to the carbon with the most hydrogens attached to it already. So if you look at the example below, um, we have two possible carbons that the hydrogen could attach to. Um, the one on the right has two hydrogens uh, attached to that. One on the left has one. And so what we discover is that the hydrogen in the HX has bonded to the side where there were the most hydrogens. Okay, it's just a rule of thumb. It's not an explanation. We're going to explain it actually um, through um, by talking about the carbocation intermediates and their relative stability. So this is the molecule on the previous slide. Okay, so it's propene. So we're reacting propene with hydrogen bromide. And if we look, um, we can see that there are two actual, two possible um, carbocation intermediates depending on which carbon the hydrogen uh, attaches to. So uh, it could attach to um, the middle carbon um, and the intermediate that we would get is the intermediate um, one. Okay, so if the hydrogen attached uh, to that hydrogen there attaches, it's going to attach to the carbon in the middle. So it's one of these hydrogens now afterwards. Um, then we've got that possible intermediate, or it could attach to the right hand or far end carbon, the one at the at the end of the carbon chain, and we would get the second intermediate. So there are two possible carbocation intermediates. Now, if we look at those intermediates, what's hopefully now clear to us is that the top one is a primary carbocation and the bottom one is a secondary carbocation. That's because we have only one alkyl group attached to the positively charged carbon in intermediate one, and two alkyl groups attached to 
the carbocation intermediate, the carbocation in intermediate two. Um, so when we look at the reaction and we look at the products shortly, um, both are actually going to happen, but there is going to be a major and minor product. And the reason for the major and minor product is going to be because of the relative stability of these two um, carbocation intermediates. And in two, we've got that secondary carbocation, and that is more stable than the primary one we formed in one. So this is the reaction completed. Um, so um, actually doing it with a different, uh, actually with a different alkene, so doing it with um, butuanine. Um, so butuanine with hydrogen chloride. We have two possible products depending on the um, carbocation intermediate. We've got one chlorobutane as a product and two chlorobutane as a product. So they are position isomers. Uh, we would get more of two chloro chlorobutane. It would be the major product. And that is because it would have gone via a secondary carbocation, which is more stable than the primary carbocation that one chlorobutane was formed via. So an exam question um, could ask you to say, draw the mechanism for either of the products. And they might say, draw the mechanism for the minor product um, in the reaction between butuanine and hydrogen chloride. Or they could ask you to draw the mechanism to make the major product. But then they may ask, um, like a subsequent question about why are there two products form or why was it the minor product or why was it the major product and you would have to explain that um, through the intermediate carbocation it's not enough to say oh two, two chlorobutane was formed via a secondary carbocation that actually wouldn't get you any marks you need to make it clear what they are both formed via and you need to make it clear which one is more stable than the other so you need to make that both of those things very clear for you to get the marks to that question. So we looked at the reaction between a hydrogen halide and um, an alkene, and we're now going to look at a halogen reacting with an alkene. So we're going to start with bromine. Uh, it could be chlorine or iodine. Um, so first thing to sort of notice is that uh, in the previous reaction we had uh, a molecule, a hydrogen halide, that was um, a polar molecule. So we had a difference in electronegativity, so we had a delta plus and delta minus. Um, if we have a halogen like bromine, chlorine or iodine, they are most definitely not polar molecules because they are two atoms, two of the same atom, they have the same electronegativity. There, there is no um, distortion of the electron density, there is no delta plus, delta minus. However, if uh, something like a molecule like bromine um, gets close, and don't forget in a reactant mixture the um, particles are moving all the time, if the bromine molecule gets close um, to the double bond, it becomes polarised. Okay, so the dipole is induced. So by saying it's an induced dipole, we are saying it's a temporary dipole. Um, so it only exists while the bromine molecule is correctly orientated and close to the carbon-carbon double bond. However, once it is polarised, uh, we are then looking at a mechanism that is identical to the hydrogen halide mechanism. So again, uh, we are looking at um, the um, pair of electrons in the pi bond of the carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, they attack the delta positive bromine. Uh, the pair of electrons in the bromine-bromine bond move on to the further out bromine to make a bromide ion. We get our carbocation intermediate, our bromide ion then attacks the positively charged carbon, uh, and then we get our products. Um, so when it was a hydrogen halide, we got a haloalkane as a product. Uh, if we react with an alkene with um, just the halogen, like bromine, we get our dihaloalkane. Um, so it's still a haloalkane, it's still a halogenoalkane, but it has um, two um, carbon halogen bonds. Um, that would allow us, if that's what we wanted, to do the same type of reactions that we would do with a halogen or alkane, um, but we would get um, both the halogens um, in this instance um, substituted so we could turn our dihalo alkane into a diol, into um, a molecule with two alcohol groups on adjacent carbons, so a diol. We can also um, react an alkene with water um, to make an alcohol. 
um, it's acid catalyzed, um, so we need um, an acid. So we use concentrated phosphoric acid um, that supplies H plus ions. Um, so again, we can follow the mechanism. Uh, the pair of electrons in the pi bond um, attack the H plus ion. We get a carbocation intermediate. Uh, we the water then attacks that positively charged carbon. So one of the lone pairs of electrons on water. So again, make sure you draw your lone pair, draw your arrow from your lone pair, and attacks the positively charged carbon. Um, we then get um, a species or sort of an intermediate species here in which the oxygen ha now has the positive charge. If you remember when I talked about halogen or alkanes uh, in that lesson and we had the nucleophilic substitution with ammonia, if you have um, an element that has more covalent bonds than it typically has, than then it typically um, would be expected to have. Um, so oxygen normally has two, here it's got three. Um, for every extra covalent bond, um, it's essentially a positive charge. So the positive charge is now on the oxygen and the pair of electrons in one of the oxygen-hydrogen bonds moves onto the oxygen. So we're basically getting a H plus um, ion removed and we end up with our alcohol and we can see that we've got the H plus ion regenerated. So the fact it's regenerated shows us that it is acting as a catalyst. Okay, so it wouldn't um, appear in the overall equation. The fourth and final version of the me this mechanism, of uh, electrophilic addition mechanism that we have to uh, appreciate is the reaction between an alkene and sulfuric acid. So first thing to sort of pay attention to is the structure of sulfuric acid. Um, so that's something that you'll also do right at the end of uh, year 13. In fact, actually, when you do period three oxides. Um, but anyway, um, that's the structure for sulfuric acid. And uh, because of the um, oxygen bonded to a hydrogen or hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, we've got a delta plus, delta minus. Um, that is why we get uh, the pi electrons now attacking the delta positive hydrogen. And then a pair of electrons in the hydrogen oxygen bond move on to the oxygen. And then we get, so it's just exactly the same mechanism that we've been looking at. We've just got a, we've just got a different species involved. We then have um, one of the lone pairs on um, the oxygen that had the hydrogen removed that attacks the positively charged carbon and we get our product. Um, the name of our product here um, is ethyl hydrogen sulfate. Okay, so the ethyl part of the name is because of that and the hydrogen sulfate part of the name is because of that. Um, so really, whatever the rest of, whatever I've circled in green, um, if we'd started with propene, then it would be propyl, hydrogen sulfate, etc. Um, so this um, species that we've got at the end, the ethyl hydrogen sulfate, really that's an intermediate uh, in the reaction to form an alcohol from an alkene. So if we then added water to this species, it would take us to the final alcohol, which in this case would be ethanol. Okay, so the final part of the alkenes topic is addition polymerization. So I expect this was something that you did, um, albeit briefly, um, at GCSE. And there isn't really a lot more to it uh, at this point than, than maybe what you did then, although um, I expect we'll be doing um, more practice of it now. So when you did cracking at GCSE, um, the, the reasons for doing cracking, you might have used one possible justification was uh, feedstocks for the chemical industry and so I think one of the things that would have been talking about was the fact that how alkenes are crucial um, to make polymers to make addition polymers anyway um, and we rely on polymers um, in so many parts of our lives so there's some examples there but plastics obviously is the biggest um, but you know glues and fibers also um, so polyester although that's not an addition polymer but anyway polyester for example um, in addition polymerization, um, one thing to realize, in, in fact, this is true of any addition reaction, is that you have a 100% atom economy, because if you have the reactants adding to each other, 
uh, there is only one product, so you, that's why you have 100% atom economy. Um, so that's something to bear in mind uh, whenever thinking about any addition reaction, but also it's particularly pertinent here with addition polymerization. So just to remind ourselves of some of the definitions, so a polymer is a, is a long chain molecule and it's made up of lots of small ones joined together. Those small molecules are called monomers, so it's a bit like having uh, the monomer being a bit like a, a Lego brick and a polymer being lots of these Lego bricks stuck together um, and of the same Lego brick. Um, uh, in addition, polymerization, we're talking about making these polymers from these monomers in which there are no other products. So these Lego bricks have literally stuck together and there's nothing else produced. So we just need to be aware of a few things um, in terms of identifying uh, different aspects of addition polymers. So we have very clearly, this circle here is very clearly showing us the monomer. So this is the monomer for this particular polymer that's being made. Um, what we've got, um, this sort of long part here, is um, the structure. Okay, so that's called the structure. Um, what we've got sort of circled here is, and it includes, that includes the um, bonds extending from the carbon. So you see the green bonds there, that includes those extending. That is the uh, repeating unit. Okay. And then the thing in the box at the bottom, and the thing that's in the brackets, that is also going to be classed as being the structure. Um, only one other thing really to say, I guess, is to remind you that N uh, means um, very large number. Okay, so it's not specifying what the, what the number is, but it is telling you it's a very large number. So you definitely saw something like this at GCSE. Um, so it's a balanced equation for the reaction. Um, so we are saying that we have N uh, ethene monomers, and we make a structure that has this repeating unit N times. So we've just got to make sure that the bonds um, extend from the carbons through the brackets to show that they are linking to the next unit. So this is just a very brief summary of what we were just sort of saying on the previous two slides. So there are a couple of final things to say about polymers. Actually, before we even talk about the strength, um, one thing is to talk about um, the state. So if you think, um, if we just think of polythene or polyethene, um, the ethene molecules are gaseous, uh, and that's because there are weak intermolecular forces. There are van der Waals forces only, and they're not terribly strong. Um, but in the polyalkene chains, we still actually only have van der Waals forces, but this time, because they're is a very long chain molecule. We know that the more electrons there are present in a molecule, the stronger the van der Waals forces, and we are talking about a lot of electrons, so we're talking about a lot of temporary dipoles. So actually, even though it's still only van der Waals forces, these uh, cumulatively are very strong, and so we get uh, our plastics or polythene um, uh, in, as, a, as a solid. Um, but because they are essentially just very long alkane molecules, so we call them polyalkene chains, but now when you think about it, when you look to those structures earlier, they are just now very, very long alkane molecules. Um, they are non-polar. There are exceptions. We could have something like polyvi polyvinyl chloride. The chloride atom could um, would have a dipole with the carbon, So, but typically non-polar. So that typically means we only have van der Waals forces between the chains. And then obviously the closer these are together, because the strength of electrostatic attraction is a consequence of both the size of the charge and the distance between those opposite charges. Um, so the closer they are together, the stronger these forces are. So the sort of very long and straight chain polymers that you get will be strong and rigid, whereas the ones that have uh, a more branch structure uh, will be weaker and more flexible because they won't get be able to get as close together um, close to each other as their straight chain ones and so those electrostatic attractions will be weaker and so they'll be able to um, slide more easily and so on which makes them more flexible. Similarly we can add things to um, a polymer, uh, something called a plasticizer, uh, which actually makes it more flexible. Um, so these plasticizer molecules they get between the chains 
and by getting between them they mean that the distance between the chains is now greater which means that the electrostatic attraction the van der Waals forces are weaker um, so that makes them easier to makes them more flexible and less rigid so there are two um, types of PVC we can have a strong and rigid version um, which we might use for window frames and drain pipes and we might have a much more flexible version which we might use for electrical cable insulation and clothing and the the reason that we have those two types is simply because in one of them we've added a plasticizer so in the one that we wanted to be flexible in the electrical cable insulation we've added a plasticizer to the polymer that's made the chain that's pushed the chains apart so the electrostatic attractions are not so strong which makes it as a consequence less rigid and that basically concludes the alkenes topic so as always any queries let me know um, and if anything is unclear in, in what I've done um, let me know that also thank you